Now, this is the last part of the marriage. Now we're going to start at First Timothy chapter 2. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now we're going to see that he's talking about Christian men here. He said to pray and to lift up these men while giving thanks for them. That's what that verse is saying. We need to pray for men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. That's what I'm saying. He's talking about Christian men here because wicked men don't live godly, do they? No. So he's talking to Christians here. Verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4, Who will have all men to be saved and then come to the, and come unto the knowledge of the truth? So God's always wanted that. He's always wanted everyone to be saved. He's always wanted that. In Isaiah forty-five twenty-two, he says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no one else. So what he's saying here, he wants everybody to look at him. Everybody. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. It's not going to happen, but that's what he wants. Like I said before, the Bible says, Broad is the way to hell. Broad. And narrow is the way to heaven. And it's not narrow because it's hard to get there. What he's saying is, there's a lot of people going to hell. And only a few people are making it to heaven. All these churches you see full with people, are they all Christians? No. There's a lot of religious people. But remember, Christianity and religion are not the same. Religious people live by traditions. The traditions of the, of the church, of men. Christians live by the Word of God. Now, we need church. There's not a perfect church out there, so if you're looking for a perfect church, you ain't going to find it because all churches are run by men. But that's, that's what we have, so when the Lord leads you to a church, and I'm mainly talking to the men because that's who he's going to get. That's who he's going to tell the, the husband, the head of the house, he's going to say, I want you to go to this church, and then his family follows. Me, I go to the Baptist church, but there's some things I do not agree with at the Baptist church. And I could just say, well, I don't agree with that and I'll go somewhere else. But then I'll find something wrong with the other next church, the next church. So there's not a perfect church out there, but we need to be in church. Church is good. Men, we need to let the Lord lead us on where to go. The Lord, not where you want to go, where the Lord wants you to go. So men, this is for you. Listen to the Lord. Listen to where he's sending you. Okay, don't go because, well, this is where my family always gone and this is where we're going to go. No, that's not being led by the Lord. That's being led by your family. Verse 5, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. Apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, meaning truth. I, now, this is Paul speaking here, just in case you didn't know. This is Paul uh, writing these words. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Men, we need to be walking in the Spirit, praying. Always praying. We should. That's that's one of the most powerful tools that a Christian has, and that's prayer. We need prayer. We all need prayer. That's why it says up here to pray for us, to have intercession for us. That means lift us up. He's saying right here, kings. Like now, it's not talking about today's kings, but back then, like King David, the kings they had back there that were Christian men. And then he says that are in the for all that are in authority. Well, we learn through his teaching that the men are in authority of the house. This is the way the Lord wants men to be, right here. He wants us to have the knowledge of the Lord. He wants us to be lifting hands, praying to him all the time, recognizing him as our God. This is what he's saying for the men. Now, the rest of the verse, he's going to address the women here. Verse 9, And like men are also... That women adore themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and 
sobriety, not with broaded hair or gold or pearls or costly array, which we talked about this the other night. Women, forget all that stuff. All this jewelry, all these diamond rings. Jody has, I have, I have bought Jody none of that stuff. She, I do not buy Jody expensive jewelry. Even though we have the money, but why? Why am I going to buy her expensive jewelry? So she can look rich? No. The Lord says, hey, it's not what you wear on the outside. Your hair, your jewelry, your clothes. He says, that's not what I'm looking at. I want to look at what's on the inside of you. That's what I'm looking at. And believe it or not, women, and if there's any single women listening to this uh, CD, Christian men are looking for a Christian woman. I see some women where before when I was lost, and I, if I was to see this woman, I would think, ugh. That's what I would think, because I was lost. But now that I'm a Christian man, when I see a Christian woman, a Christian woman walking with the Lord, to me, that is very beautiful. Very beautiful. When I was lost, that wouldn't have been. But now, that's what I see. So Christian women, you want a Christian man, then walk a Christian life. If you want to attract other kind of men, then go ahead and wear all this jewelry and makeup and your hair and your clothes. You know, go ahead and do that. But you're attracting the wrong man. Y'all hear me? And this is especially for the single women who if they're sending, listening to the CD. Verse 10. But with good works, which becometh women professing godliness. Women who claim to be Christians should make themselves attracted by the things they do. That's what he's saying. That's what should make you attractive is by the things you do. Verse 11, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to assert authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now I've already taught that also. And this is the reason, verse 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. And I've told you before, this is why, women, the Lord has put the man as the head, because of Eve. Okay, I've already taught that. But the, right here, saying it in black and white, it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman. Verse 15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith, in charity, and holiness with sobriety. Right here it says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. That does not mean, women, you're going to heaven, you're getting born again you're for having children. Because that's, that's what it sounds like. She shall be saved in childbearing. That means, you know, it sounds like if you're having children, then you're going to be saved. No, that's not, what it, that's not what he's talking about. When we read the whole Bible, we know that's not what he's saying. What he's saying here, women, because of you, we, we've become sinners. But now, what you, what you need to do is with your children, with your children, don't let them make the same mistake you made. Teach them in the way of the Lord. That's what it's talking about. Eve made a big mistake, but now the Lord's saying, save your children by teaching them the truth. Teaching them about the Lord. It's the man's responsibility, right? To teach the women and the children. But who's with the children all the time? Or should be? The wife, because she's at home. The mother. So the, mo the mother has a lot of influence on the kids. A lot. Because she's with them a whole lot more than the husband is. Because he has to work. So women, right here, the Lord saying, teach your children. Teach your children. Because of what you did, teach them not to do the same thing. In Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And this is for the husbands and the wife. God says, He worketh in you to do his will and his good pleasure. So wives, he's working in you to do his will and his good. And what have we learned about wives? He's working it in you to do his will. And we, the wives, we know what his will is now. And good pleasure. So wives, submit to your husband. Don't grit your teeth because that's not good pleasure. Does that show you're having good pleasure at submitting to your husband? No. He said he's working it in you the will, the want, and the good pleasure. You should enjoy submitting to your husband. 
That's what the Word of God says. Not only for you, but for the men. He said, this is for both, the men also. Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And how many times have, has Christ have to figure, had, has had to forgive the church for the mistakes the church makes? A lot. But he keeps forgiving them. And he keeps forgiving them. And he keeps forgiving them. So husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And guess what? This is his will for you and your good pleasure. Men, it should, it should be an enjoyment for us to love our wife as Christ loved the church. That should be a joy for us. It shouldn't, that's another thing. We shouldn't have to grit our teeth. Ugh. You know, living with her is, ooh. Shouldn't be like that. God said it's supposed to be our good pleasure to love our wives. Amen? In, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. That's for the women. Verse thirty-five. And if they learn, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in church. Two things here: women don't run the churches. Pastors and deacons run the churches. That's what it's saying here. Not women. There's we got religions out there who have women pastors. That's not of God. And in the next chapter that we're reading, uh, chapter uh, 3 of, of Timothy, it says the qualifications for being a preacher, and he says these are the qualifications. If you want to be a preacher, this is the qualifications. And everything he says in there is addressing a man. So women, you're not reading the Word of God. If you're a woman pastor, you're not reading the Word of God. Because the Word of God says women to be silent in the church. And also, you do not meet the qualifications of being a preacher. It's in the Word of God. We're all preachers. But that's as far as ministering and telling people about the Lord. But I'm talking about being pastors. Right here, plainly says it. Now, women who are, who are being preachers in the church, I wouldn't want to belong to that church. Because if they're not obeying that, what's the other verses they're not going to obey? You understand what I'm saying? Husbands, if your wife has an ass comes to you and has a question for you, biblically, that's in the Bible, you better know the answer. Because what does it say right here? And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. So husbands, we need to know the Word of God. Because our wife is going to come to us with questions. And if we don't know the answer, guess what? She might go somewhere else. And if where she's going, they could, it could be a wolf. She might be getting something that's not of God. So you better know the Word of God so she can come to you and have trust in you that you're going to know. Don't let her, don't go to her and say, well, I, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, then say, okay, babe, I'm going to study it. I'm going I'm to get the answer for you. I'm going to ask the Lord and ask the Lord to teach me, to show me what the answer is to your question. So wives, go to your husband. Ask him a question that you don't understand. Make him get into the Word of God. So he can answer you. You see what I'm saying? Make him get into the Word of God. And man, if you're just saying, I don't know, and that's it, you're leaving it alone, guess what? You are not being the head of that house. You are not being the head of the house when you do not have answers for your wife. Because we're the head spiritually. Not just the provider, but we're the spiritual head also. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now what these verses are saying, you know, husbands, if your wife is excited and, and it's time to go to the bedroom, don't, to, don't say no to her. Wives, same thing. If your husband's ready... But number five, verse five says, Defraud ye not one another. It's saying defraud means deprive. Don't deprive one another. And we're talking about sex. Except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontence. 
means meaning sexual appetite. So the Lord is saying, okay, do not deny one another. Wife, if your husband is tired, he's been working, and you see that he's truly tired, you know, understand. And vice versa. Husbands, if your wife, you've seen she's had a hard day at, at, at home, taking care of the kids, ironing your clothes, washing your clothes, and you can see that she's really tired, husbands, be understandable about that. Just don't say, hey, I'm ready, let's go. No. Right here it says, husbands, your body's not yours no more. Wives, your body's not yours no more. But both spouses should be understanding on when it should be. This the wife, I got a headache. No. If you don't have a headache, then don't deny your husband. Husband, oh, I'm tired. I had a hard day at work today. But you really didn't? But you're saying that because you don't want to have sex with your wife? That's a no-no. And if you do, verse 5 says, if you do, only do it for prayer or fasting. Husband, tell your wife, babe, for the next day, two days, three days, whatever it may be, I'm going to be fasting and praying for whatever. And the wife, you need to leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fasting is, we, uh, I had a teaching, I had a teaching on fasting and, and, uh, Fasting is, 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 yeah, is not eating. When you fast, the Lord says, don't let, it, let everybody know you're fasting. So if you fast, I'm just not understanding how it's connected. If you fast, if you're fasting, you're not supposed to be having intercourse with you? No. Fasting, there's a fasting of eating, but then there's also a fasting of, of sex. It's right here. Okay. The Lord's saying, if you're going to if you're fasting from not having, you know, there, this is a, a fasting from not having sex. Okay. Fasting can be of anything you're going to stop. That you're, that you're denying yeah, but biblically, fasting is either, it's a fasting of not eating, there's a fasting of not eating and drinking, which when you don't eat and you don't drink, now the Lord did put a time limit on that one. He didn't put a time limit on just fasting, not eating, because Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, and he didn't eat. He said, he, and when it was over, he was hungry. He didn't say he was thirsty. He was hungry. So he had a fasting of not eating. But everywhere it says they fasted from eating and drinking, it says they only did it for three days. So if you ever do that kind of fast where you're not going to eat or drink, biblically, you shouldn't go more than three days. Because what did I say? God made these bodies. He knows what these bodies can do. And if he puts a time limit on how long you should go without eating or drinking, and it's three days, then I wouldn't go more than three days. But anyway, there's a fasting of sex also. But remember, when you get over it, when you're, when you're finished, go back to them. Because it says, it says right here, except it be with consent for a time. For a time. Doesn't say how long. Could be a day, could be a week. I don't know. It says for a time. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. That Satan tempt you not for your for your sexual appetite. Women, I'm going to talk to women. If you're, if you're going to fast and you're like telling your husband, well, I'm still fasting just so you won't have sex. But why do you think the Lord put this in here? That Satan wouldn't tempt us? The Lord knows us. If you're not getting it at home, what happens? And I'm not saying that's the right way. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But he knows the devil is going to tempt a man. Well, your wife is not, you know, so that's why he said it right here, the last part of that verse. So Satan wouldn't tempt you. So don't go long without sex. And it's both of y'all in agreement. And, and y'all, you know, both of y'all. But wives, if your husband is wanting it, then don't deny the spouse. And that's plainly what it's saying here. Do not deny your spouse. Forget the headaches. Unless you really have one. Also, do not. And you know married people do this. Do not use your body to get back to your husband. Well, I'll show you. You did that, I'll show you. I ain't giving you nothing for a week, two weeks. Now, tell me that doesn't happen. Yes, it does happen. That happens. And, I, and hopefully maybe y'all don't know because y'all don't do that. But I'm 56 years old and it happens. Okay, I've been through life a little bit. But it does happen. Wives, you get mad and you cut your husband off. 
That's wrong. Don't do that. And vice versa, but usually it's not the other way around. And men, do not. Look at Playboy, Hustler, any pornography out there, uh, rated, uh, rated X movies. Don't go look at these magazines or movies and then come home and make love to your li- wife having that in the back of your mind. That is wrong. That is sin. And I'm talking to husbands. That is wrong. When you're having sex with your wife, you're having sex with your wife. Not the girl in the magazine. Not the girl in the rated X movie. If you're doing that, you need to fall on your knees and repent. Do not. Do not think of someone else while you're having sex with your spouse. And that goes both ways. Do not think of someone else when you're having sex with your spouse. There's nothing wrong with sex. God invented sex. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled. What you and your husband do in bed, it's okay with God. The bed is undefiled to a husband and wife. So enjoy each other. What you and your husband want to do in bed, it's fine with God. But to each other and not with mechanisms. Do not take pleasure toys into the bed. You go to some of these stores and that's all they have is, is toys for, for sex. The Lord didn't, didn't make these toys. The Lord gave you a husband and he gave you a wife. You enjoy each other in the bed. You joy in each other. That's it. Let's see what the Lord says about marriage and children. Now, some of us have children. Some of us don't have children. So those who don't have children learn now. And those of us who do have children and they're not grown up yet, you can still learn. Let's see what the scriptures say. Proverbs thirteen twenty four. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. This is the word of God. I just read the word of God to you. It's those who spare the rod of discipline, whether it be the belt, a paddle, whatever it is. It don't have to be a rod, but if you spare that 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 rod, you hate your children. So if you don't discipline. For not disciplining. Now who hates their children? Y'all don't have any yet, but I'm sure when y'all do, y'all not going to hate them. I don't know, you know. I was going to say, I don't know anybody who hates their children, but if you watch the news, you got mothers who are killing their kids all the time. I just can't understand that. So I can't make that statement. But right here, we're talking about Christians. If you do not discipline your children, you're not showing them love. This is the Word of God. Proverbs 15.5 A fool despises, despiseth his father's instructions, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Whoever learns from his from correction is wise. Children who listen to their fathers, it says right here they're wise. Children who listen to their fathers. And why does it say fathers here and not parents? Because the father is the head. Okay? Everything comes from here and goes down. Proverbs nineteen eighteen. Chastison thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So what he's saying here, hey, I know how it is. You're spanking your child and they're crying. That gets to you. But he says not to let that get to you. If they need correction, you need to correct them. Why do you think the world, part of the reason, the world is where it's at today? Because the parents not disciplining their kids. Why do you think our prisons are all filled? They're so filled, they're letting people out when they shouldn't be out because there's no room for them. Why do you think that is? Because parents did not chastise, correct, discipline their children. And when you, don't, when you don't discipline them when they're this age, young, when they're this age, that's the way they're going to be. They're not going to understand authority. They're not going to understand authority. So when the law says something to them, well, they're not going to listen to the law just like they didn't listen to the parents. Now, this is one of the hardest things to do when you're disciplining. They got all these sicknesses coming out on TV. Well, the child has this or the child has that. That's how come he doesn't listen. Children, you spank them until they learn. Children have, they're, 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 they're stubborn. You got children who are very stubborn. And sometimes you have to spank them until you break that stubbornness. And it's not easy. It's not easy. It's hard for the parent. But you have to do it. If you want your child to grow up 
in the Lord's way, this is what you need to do. Do not spare the rod. Break the stubbornness that they have. You have to break it. And I have to say, yes, I've done it not with my children, but I've done it with my grandson. He threw himself on the floor. I told him to get up. He wouldn't get up. I spanked him with the belt, not on the butt, because it has been known if you hit him too hard on, on the hiney, it could hurt the front. So the best way to spank him is on behind the leg. So that's what I did. I spanked him behind the leg, and he wouldn't get up. I spanked him again. He wouldn't get up. Well, he was showing me how stubborn he was going to be. Well, I've, I've read the Word of God. It took like 10 minutes before he finally got up. But I did break that stubbornness. I spanked him until he got up. It was not easy for me. It was something I didn't want to do, but I had to do it. But now my grandson listens to me. He doesn't give me any trouble. When Grandpa says something, he listens. That's what we need to do. And it, uh, when, I, when I used to spank my daughters, and I used to tell them, hey, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you, <laughs> they thought I was being funny. But now one of my daughters, she has kids. Now she knows what I'm talking about. Because it does hurt the parent to spank their kids. But it's something we have to do. We're getting right here in the, in the scriptures. We've got to discipline them. Now, some children, just, a, just a, a voice of authority is enough. You don't even have to spank them because just your voice of authority is enough. But with some children, it's not. Proverbs twenty three thirteen. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Meaning if you correct him, he's not going to go, he's not going to be a rebellious child. When it says he shall not die, it's not talking about physical death. He's saying he's not gonna he's not gonna be a rebellious child when he grows up. Proverbs twenty nine fifteen. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So right here saying again, the rod gives wisdom. When you spank him to teach him what's right, what's wrong, that gives him wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother shame. That means a child that is not corrected will bring the mother shame. Do we understand so far? Disciplining your children. If you read the word, the Lord is very strict on that. Because you get a child when they're young, it's just like an oak tree. You get a tree, or if you put a rope on it and the tree is leaning, and you put that rope straight for the tree to grow straight, once that tree is grown, that oak is grown, you're not going to change it. It's going to grow straight. So this is what we need to do with our children. Have them straight while they're young, while they can be flexible. Because once they grow up, it's just like an oak tree. That oak, you're not going to bend that oak tree. The only chance of these kids, the only chance they have is that they get born again. But we're going to, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your children, and they will give you peace in, of mind and will make your heart glad. Discipline your children. It will it'll give you peace of mind, and it will make your heart glad. But well, Jesse, how is it going to make my heart glad when I'm having to spank them? Because when, when they grow old, when they grow up, they're, they're not going to depart from what you taught them. And that's biblical. That's biblical. When you, if you train a, a child now in the way it should go, when that child grows old, the Lord says they won't depart from it. Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou hast walk, walkest by the way, and when thou layest down, and when thou risest up. So what he's saying here, mainly... Talk to your children constantly. Talk to them. Give them the commands that, that, that we know. Son, daughter, whatever it may be, both. Teach them. Teach them in the way of the Lord. Right here it says it. Teach them. When you're sitting down at home, when you're walking, when you're lying down, when they raise up in the morning. So what it's saying right here, constantly teach your children. It's a constant thing. Okay? Not just at night, but right here it says at night, in the morning, when you're walking with them, throughout the day. Proverbs 22.6. Now this is, this is what I was talking about just now. 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train them when they're young. Train them when they're young. It says, and this is the word of God. This is a promise. God said it himself. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen? That is a promise. I, this, this verse, this is a great verse. That's an amen. Amen. That's a big amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. I got this out of the Living Bible because it, it is a little easier to understand. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. Now he's talking about the kids here. If you honor your father and mother, if your kids grow up and you're teaching them about the Lord, well, they're going to know that they need to honor you because that's the word of God. <clears throat> things will go well for you. And you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instructions and instructions that come from who? From the Lord. From the Lord. Not instructions that come from the, from the school. Not instructions that come from this TV. Because in school and on TV, they're teaching you, uh, they're, they're totally getting away from the Lord. It says, instructions that come from the Lord. And how are you going to teach them about the Lord? It's because you've, you've learned. Okay? How can you teach them instructions of the Lord if you don't know the Word of God of yourself? Right? So men, again, you've got to know the Word of God. And if you know the Word of God, you teach your children how to discipline them and instruct them in the way of the Lord. In the Old Testament times. Now this was, this was in the Old Testament. This is, what, this is what happened in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 18 through 21. I wish this was still today. Suppose a man has a stubborn or rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother even though they discipline him. In such a case the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. Their parents must say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way you will purge this evil from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. Fathers, don't depend on the church or someone else to do this. This is what they did in the Old Testament. And seriously... If they were still do this today, who you wouldn't have all these kids that are being rebellious. This is the word of God, okay? I'm not. This is not a, a story I'm pulling out of a book. We're reading the word of God. This is what the word of God says. This is what, the way they had it. If the parents went to the elders and said, "My son just absolutely refuses to obey me," this is what happens. This is what this is what the uh, they did back then. I'm just saying if we did do this today, we wouldn't have so many rebellious kids out there. Well, this was the instructions on marriage by the Word of God. This, this, if you go by the instructions that the Lord has given us on these teachings, I guarantee you that you will have a blessed and successful marriage with no divorce. That's a guarantee you. Because these are God's words. He's the one who, who said, Women do this, men do this, and if it's His way, there's, some, there's no way it could fail. So if you don't want to end up in divorce, do what the scripture says, husband, wife. If you decided to do it your way and not the Lord's way, well, go ahead, but don't blame God for the outcome. I hope you go over these teachings again and about every two to three years and that's what the wife and I have done we go over these marriage teachings to refresh our minds on what on what my duties are as a husband and my wife listens to them so she can refresh her mind on what her duties are as a wife I hope you I hope you have enjoyed this teaching